Our story picks up around the year 3100 BC with King Narmer's unification of Egypt and the start of the early dynastic period of Egypt's history. Prior to that, the agricultural villages of Upper and Lower Egypt had seen the rule of two distinct rulers wearing two distinct crowns. Narmer came from the south, or Upper Egypt, where he ruled wearing white royal headgear shaped like an unfinished at the bottom bowling pin. Meanwhile, up north, or Lower Egypt, the area topping off with the northern running Nile's water leaving through the delta into the ocean, there was a different ruler with a different hat, a red one. While Narmer's name and status are known from numerous objects, including beyond Egypt and the Canaan, the most famous Narmer object comes to us from within the Horus Temple, that object being the Narmer Palette. This large and highly decorated palette from around 3100 years ago is thought by many to show Narmer defeating the northern ruler. He's shown on one side with the crown of Upper Egypt, and then the crown of Lower Egypt on the other. His name is found atop both sides of the palette within a symbol of kingship, a serach, and he's shown poised to fell his foe with his mace. Narmer's successor, Hor Aha, continued the First Dynasty of Egypt, and his burial, along with some other First Dynasty kings, are known, and they were buried under mastabas. They also have two burial places, one in the south at Abydos or Nakata, and one in the north at Saqqara or Hilwan. Hor Aha's tomb in Abydos has 36 subsidiary burials, which included people who were either killed or made to kill themselves, as well as some dogs to accompany him to the afterlife. These subsidiary burials are known to have occurred for a number of the First Dynasty pharaohs, and the last known instance of the practice comes from the 26 subsidiary burials of the last First Dynasty pharaoh who ruled around 2910 BC, Ka. An earlier First Dynasty pharaoh, Den, had 136 people buried with him, and his tomb is also the first to be paved with granite. A label from his tomb shows him running in the said festival, a festival celebrated by generally longer ruling pharaohs, which was meant to magically revivify the pharaohs so that he would retain the vigor needed to maintain proper order as he aged. The graves containing these First Dynasty pharaohs have been robbed, and the only body part that's been found is a now discarded and forever gone arm of a mummy found with a serach bracelet we still have. This arm with the bracelet was found stuffed into a wall in the tomb associated with Jur at Abydos, though the arm may not have been from the pharaoh Jur himself. Jur's tomb would come in the Middle Kingdom to be seen as the tomb of Osiris, and he was buried with 318 subsidiary burials. While the pharaoh's bodies were buried underneath the ground, a one-story structure, the aforementioned Mastaba, was built atop the ground and could have many rooms. With the First Dynasty at a close, we enter into the mysterious Second Dynasty of Egypt's Old Kingdom around 2890 BC. We don't know much about the Second Dynasty, who leave little signs of their history. However, the Second Dynasty may have seen some serious internal conflicts for Egypt. Nonetheless, when the Third Dynasty emerged, it was more powerful and efficient than the one at the end of the First, and this speaks to a long-term trend of governmental consolidation and broader evolution during the foggy Second Dynasty. The Third and Fourth Dynasties of Egypt are the age of the pyramids, with the Fourth being the one when actual smoothed-out pyramids were constructed. Pyramid building would continue beyond the 4th dynasty, but never again to the scale of before. Djoser is the first pharaoh of the 3rd dynasty, starting his reign around 2686 BC. With the start of his rule, we leave the early dynastic period and enter the Old Kingdom of Egypt. It's under his rule, and for his burial, that Egypt constructs their first pyramid, though it's not a true pyramid. It's a step pyramid, and when it was constructed, that first layer initially had a more conventional mastaba form, though for the normal rectangular mastaba, this mastaba-like form was unconventionally square, and this relatively conventional mastaba form was adjusted, and then added the stacking of progressively smaller mastaba-like structures atop each other. A further change we see is that now burial for the pharaoh is in the north at Saqqara, and while Djoser maintains a secondary burial site, this burial isn't far to the south in Abydos, rather on the southern end of his pyramid complex. Two other pyramids of the third dynasty are the unfinished buried pyramid for the pharaoh following Djoser, and the similarly architectured ruined layer pyramid. But it would wait for the first pharaoh of the fourth dynasty, Sneferu, 
for pyramid building to shift from this stepped approach and the first attempts at a smooth sided pyramid were made. It's in the 4th dynasty that pyramid building evolves into the grandest pyramids of Egypt. But first were the failed experiments. Number one is the Maidum Pyramid, a failed pyramid which demonstrates the first ever attempt for a smoothed out pyramid shape which they attempted to bring about by filling out the steps with limestone. This attempt collapsed and the pyramid complex was left incomplete. Snefru had a second pyramid constructed which arrives to us uniquely with much of its limestone casing intact and perhaps due to instability arising during its construction, it was finished out at the top on a tighter angle, giving it the name the Bent Pyramid. Still remaining in the Dashor Necropolis, a kilometer north of the Bent Pyramid, sits the third and final pyramid built under Sneferu, the first successful smooth-sided pyramid, the Red Pyramid. This is thought to be Sneferu's burial place. The Red Pyramid is so named due to the red limestone now exposed from under the white limestone casing it once had. After Sneferu came Khufu. Khufu built the biggest pyramid of them all, then 480 feet tall and estimated to be composed of 2.3 million large blocks, the Great Pyramid of Giza. Khufu was followed by Jedefre, the first pharaoh whose name is connected to the sun god Re, and Jedefre left behind the unfinished and now in ruins Pyramid of Jedefre. Then came Khafre, who had constructed for him the second largest of the pyramids, checking in a mere 30 feet shorter than Khufu's and at a steeper angle. And Khafre also had the Sphinx carved out in his pyramid complex. The next successful pyramid is that of Menkere, the smallest of the three large Giza Plateau pyramids, checking in at 215 feet tall. Near the entrance are granite casing blocks, some of which are unfinished and point to the possibility that construction was halted upon Menkere's death. Interestingly, with the likely last pharaoh of the 4th dynasty, Shepsiskaf, we have a move to South Saqqara for his tomb and a return to the traditional Mastaba. With the end of the 4th dynasty, the great pyramid building times had come to a close. Pyramids would continue to be built, but none reaching the size of the pyramids of the 4th dynasty, and the pharaohs themselves were having their singular power over Egypt alter as local rulers, still under the pharaoh's rule, grew in power and influence. The 5th dynasty sees a turn to adoration of Re. We've already seen some of this in the names of Khafre and Jedefre of the prior 4th dynasty, and even Shepsiskaf's name, which means his Ka is noble, may be referring to Re's Ka, not Shepsiskaf's. For the 5th dynasty, while the first pharaoh's name Userkaf does not yet necessarily reflect this pro re orientation, Userkaf's building of a temple to Re does demonstrate this devotion. And the following pharaohs have names that are clearly re oriented such as Userkaf's successor, Sahu Re, whose name means he who is close to Re. While Userkaf had his pyramid built in Saqqara, near Djoser's, Sahure's pyramid is in Abu Sir, where the pyramids of the other 5th dynasty pharaohs remain as well, excepting the last three who return to Saqqara. The Rey named pharaohs remain up through the second to last pharaoh of the dynasty, Jedkare. Jedkare was succeeded by Unas, the last ruler of the 5th dynasty of Egypt. And while Unas's rule takes place in a period of economic decline for Egypt, one lasting tradition he'd leave behind were the many incantations along the walls of his burial chamber, the so-called pyramid texts. These are better conceptualized as the successful path to the afterlife texts. With incantations to see Unas' body protected in the pyramid, have Unas see safe passage across the sky, and finally have Unas successfully entering the afterlife. Across time, these texts would find their way beyond the burial chamber of pyramids to the inside of other tombs and the insides of coffins themselves. The Sixth Dynasty sees further growth of the power of nomarchs and perhaps the priesthood, and power is further decentralized as the tombs of nobles grow significantly in size and extravagance. This was exacerbated under the reign of Pepi II, and with his power declining and local rulers increasingly acting of their own will and desires, we drift out of the Old Kingdom of Egypt and formally enter the first intermediate period of Egyptian history around 2180 BC, shortly after Pepi's death. The intermediate period saw a fractured and far less powerful Egypt and is a long dark age to history from which Egypt would awaken into the Middle Kingdom and be unified under a pharaoh once more.